Okay, I think we're ready. Um, I would like to call to order this uh, October 7th Board of Assessment Review meeting. Um, may we have the, the uh, roll call, please? Mr. Sanchez? Present. Ms. Torrens? Present. Mr. Chamberlain? Here. Mr. Peoples? Here. Mr. Parkinson? Here. All right, thank you. Uh, may we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, item four on the agenda made the approval of the minutes from September 16th, 2019 Board of Assessment Review meetings. Do we have any questions on those? Would someone like to move them and we can have a discussion, if any? Move for acceptance. <coughs> Make a motion we accept the minutes as written. Thank you, Matt. Second? I'll second. All right, Melinda, uh, any discussion on the minutes? All right, all, all in favor? All right, carried. All right, and which brings us to tonight's hearing. Um, you know, our appeals board for, let's see, I'll read them all into the, um, into the hearing, Fox Car Foxcroft Apartments, LLC, Coach Linton Apartments, Oak Hill Holdings, uh, JDR Trust 2, Oak Hill Oaks, LLC, West Oaks, LLC, Meadowwoods Associates, Oak Hill Village, and Corner Holdings, taxpayer. Um, and can anybody that's going to be testifying that needs to be sworn in, could you stand now and uh, be sworn in? Do you swear that this is truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Note that it was affirmative. <coughs> All right. And this, the uh, process is that we hear from the uh, taxpayer. Right? That's correct. Taxpayer first? No, no. The, the, the assessor first. The assessor first, taxpayer, and then. Is that first, if you have any questions during the course, uh, you get to ask uh, after the assessors made their presentation. Of course, the board can and can and and sometimes does interrupt uh, your your talk if we have questions along the way, and then we just switch. And then you you get to present your case. The taxpayer, the uh, the assessor gets to. Um, ask your questions if needed be, and we get to ask questions throughout the process to both. Okay? All right, having said that, uh, Jim, you want to start? Yes, please. Uh, first of all, for the record, Jim Katsafikas with the law firm of Perkins Thompson here representing the town of Scarborough's assessor. It's uh, always struck me as a bit odd that the assessor goes first where the assessor has the uh, has a presumption, the assessment has a presumption of validity, but that's okay. We, we, this is the process and we'll, we'll go with it. We have here tonight the assessor to speak as to uh, the properties in question here, but also the town manager this evening to, to talk about the process because I, I believe that what's at issue here is not, uh, it's not an overvaluation, but discriminatory taxation. And I think what he has to say may be helpful to, to the board uh, on that matter. I'd like to start first though with the assessor, with Mr. Buffard. Um, and if I may, would you like, would you prefer that I take him through some questions for the record? Does that work better for the board, or do you want to hear a narrative? Whatever, whatever you okay. wish. Either or for us, it doesn't really matter. Because you'll ask your questions anyway. We're going to ask our questions anyway if right. we have any. Very good. Okay. Well, to start, uh, David, for the record, could you please state your name and your position with the town? Uh, David Buffard, assessor. How long have you been assessor? Uh, full time, um, two years, almost two years. What did you do before that? Immediately prior, I worked for the state of Maine, Maine Revenue Service, and prior to that, I worked here as the assistant assessor for five years. How long were you at Maine Revenue Service? Uh, almost 12 years. Okay. In your work as assessor this year, uh, you received 
some abatement applications from Oak Hill Holdings and related companies, correct? Correct. That was in, what, March of this year? In March, correct. What did you do after you received those? I requested more information. So we call a Section 706 Section letter? Section 706 letter, correct. And did they provide that? They did. They provided uh, appraisals for the apartment complexes, uh, a total of six uh, apartment complexes. And I've got the uh, appraisals here with me. Okay. Uh, we didn't put those in the record. Uh, if the question is not valuation, then the appraisal is not relevant. And so we want to spare a few trees. Yeah. Uh, but they're here if we, if we all need them. Probably more than a few. Yeah. I think that's probably true. Plus, it would have meant more reading. Uh, but you did take a look at those appraisals, correct? I did. And you put together a table of uh, the assessed value in the appraisal? Yes, uh, that would be exhibit two, I believe. What, is, what does that tell you as an assessor looking at the assessed values and the appraised values? Well, I took those six uh, apartment complexes and listed their assessed values and the appraised values. Uh, of the six, five of the appraisals support the assessments uh, based on 2018 19. Uh, one, is lower than the assessed value, but that appraisal was performed in 2011. So it's about eight years old. Yes. Right. Okay. And the uh, you have you provided valuation cards for all of the properties for which Oak Hill Holdings. I did. And that's Exhibit One. Yes. Okay. So it's the appraisal cards. But you noted that the appraised and assessed values are pretty similar for these properties, correct? Yes, they are. So this, this isn't an overvaluation case. This is an unjust discrimination case, right. is that your understanding? Right. Okay. When was the last time that Scarborough conducted a town-wide revaluation? The last revaluation was performed in 2005 by the, uh, one of the prior assessors, Paul Lesburns. And there were attempts to revalue after that, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but a revaluation occurred in 2018 for commercial properties Correct. and industrial properties, and for residential properties in 2019? That's correct. We just completed that. All right. And before you did that, though, uh, before you did the, the, before the revaluation was done, did you do a ratio study of assessed values and sales for the commercial properties and industrial properties? I did a uh, ratio study for commercial properties uh, for sales from 2015 through 2018, which is your Exhibit 4. Okay. <clears throat> And that ratio came out to 67%. Did you also perform a study on the residential properties about the same time? I did. I performed a racial study for the residential properties, including uh, 2016 and 2017, which is Exhibit 5. And what was the that ratio was 86%. So it was 67% ratio for commercial industrial and 86% for residential. Right. Right. What did that tell you as an assessor? Uh, it was pretty clear to me that the commercial properties were undervalued significantly more than the residential properties. And have you done any ratio studies or any examined the uh, assessed value versus sales for commercial property since the revaluation was done? That would be Exhibit 10. I have a list of commercial sales post revaluation. In other words, uh, occurring after the revaluation of 2018. Uh, there's about eight sales here, and the average ratio of these eight sales is about 
our goal in performing the commercial revaluation was to bring them closer to 100% uh, market value. And the sales, this sales uh, study is showing us that uh, the values, the commercial property values through sales are increasing at a faster rate than we thought. So to get back to, for a moment to the revaluation data, of uh, the revaluation, the, uh, so the town completed the revaluation and hired a company last year for the commercial and industrial properties. Correct. Who'd you hire? We hired KRT appraisal company out of uh, Massachusetts. Okay, and so those values became effective April 1 of? Of 2018. And then was the same company hired by the town for the residential it was. side? We hired the same company to do the residential eval, and that and those values are effective April 1, 2019. Those are the questions I have for the assessor. Do you want to ask him questions now, or shall I call the town manager first, and then the questions can open up? And, unless. There isn't a question. I think you want to just kind of plod forward, unless you have questions of what he's said today. So I, I, I do have questions for Mr. Buffard. Should I go ahead and ask my questions now? Yeah, I don't see why not. Okay. <clears throat> All right. For the record, um, my name is Kelly McDonald from Murray Plum and Murray. I'm counsel for the all of the applicants here. Um, and uh, I, I uh, agree with Attorney Katsi Fikas' uh, summary that this is an appeal about uh, unjust discrimination as opposed to overvaluation. So I'm, I want to ask the assessor some questions about this revaluation process. All right, so, Mr. Buffard, is it fair to say that well, actually, let's just start with some terminology because we refer to tax years as 2017, 2018, and 2018, 2019. Do I have that correct? Correct. Okay. And so is it fair to say that in tax year 2017, 2018, all the properties in town, from your perspective, were valued below fair market value? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, and the town's goal, and, and those values dated back to that assessment that took place in 2005. Right. Now, were those values, were those put in place for the 2006-2007 tax year? Those same values as 2005? What, what, what tax year did those values become effective? Um, if you know, you were the assessor then. Right, if you know. Yeah. I don't know. Nothing. So, um, we'll, should, should, we'll talk about it as a 2005 assessment. Okay. And um, the, the town's goals with the 2005 revaluation was to bring all the properties as close to fair market value as possible, right? I'm assuming that was the goal. Yes. All right. And since then, it's your view that the market has moved? Yes. Okay. And the goal of this revaluation, I think you just said something along these lines, is to bring, eventually at least, all the properties up to 100% of fair market value. Correct. And I want to make sure I understand, we've been talking about ratios here, and I want to make sure I understand the math behind this. Uh, when we talk about the ratio, you're comparing the assessed value to the fair market value. Correct. And so, for example, if the, if the fair market value of a property is $100,000 and the assessed value is $80,000, then you would say that the ratio is 80%, uh, that the assessed value is 80% of fair market value. That's correct. All right. That's what I thought. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. And uh, as someone with uh, great experience in tax, uh, you'll agree that the main constitution requires properties to be, to be assessed at fair market value. Yes. Um, and here the town decided to do a two-step process for this latest revaluation, correct? Correct. All right. Now, uh, your council talked about industrial and commercial. It's, it's, it's probably more accurate to call that non-residential, right? Because that include other categories other than industrial and commercial, right? Well, primarily commercial and industrial. But it also right. included municipal and school and nonprofits and right. yeah. So I'm going to call that category non-residential. Do you have any quarrel with that characterization? Yes. All right. So we've got non-residential first, and then residential, right? 
and the intent, and, and so um, I, I looked at your website, very nice website, and it says um, assessment ratio certified 100%. Can you explain what that means? Are you talking about the state evaluation? I'm talking about the uh, phrase on your website where it says assessment ratio certified 100%. Does that, does that mean that with the new residential values in place that, uh, that the uh, idea is that the, all the properties in town are now up to 100% of fair market value? I think that refers to the state valuation where we certify at 100%. We're allowed to do that. And what does it mean to certify something at 100%? What, what calculations go into that? What does that mean? Uh, each year we are asked to, to certify the, uh, uh, the ratio. And we, if we're within a certain range, we can certify at 100%. What's that range? Uh, usually it's about 10% 10, 10 range. OK. So that certification that you made to the state is for the tax year 2019-2020? 2019, correct. Well, actually, uh, 2018, uh, I, yes, 2019, that's the most recent. Because in 2018, 2019, the residential values had not gone into effect yet, correct? The residential rebound had not. Okay. So the, certifi well, the certification refers to 2019, 2020. So, is that correct? On the website? Yeah. And the one that the town that you made to the state. I think the website is referring to the state valuation that um, maybe the uh, main revenue services performs each year. Uh, they send an agent to audit our assessments and they certify us. And so you, the town has been certified as being at 100%. The ratio assessment to fair market value is certified at 100% at this time. Right. And that's after the revaluation of the non-residential sector and the residential sector. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Right. Okay, great. The, um, let's talk about the 2018 revaluation of the non-residential properties. Um, the, the valuation for that sector went from 725 million to 972 million. Does that sound right to you? Sounds about right. All right, uh, which is an increase of uh, which is um, an increase of 34 percent. Does that sound about right? Are you, ref are you referring to a? Um, an item in the... I, I am. Let me uh, direct your attention, uh, Mr. Buffard, to Exhibit 8. The town's Exhibit 8. And in the third paragraph, this is where I got those numbers from. In the third paragraph down at the bottom, it says a percent change of 34.2%. Do you see that? Now, according to, are you familiar with, um, are you familiar, uh, in Exhibit 9, there is a memo from Mr. Hall to the members of the town council, kind of the second half of that Exhibit 9. <clears throat> Would you let me know when you have found that? Mr. Hall is okay. here, he'd like to ask you questions about it. I wasn't expecting Mr. Hall to be here, and I might just do that, but let's ask Mr. Clark this question. <laughs> Are you familiar with this memo? I think I've seen it before. All right. Can I, yes. Kelly, can I hold you up just of a moment? Course, of course. Does anybody have that memo? So this is it's, Exhibit it's 9. Right, if you go backwards from item 10, it's the last four pages, or last, yeah. Go backwards from 10 into 9, and it's the end of 9. Thank you. That was a, a good explanation. Well, because there's so many things before it. So. We'll go to the end, last four pages. All right. I think I got it. You all set? Yep. 
thank you. Just letting us catch up a little bit here. Yeah, th thank you for slowing me down. <clears throat> Mr. Buffard, you see in uh, about the middle of that first paragraph on the first page of that memo, a sentence which says, in fact, the entire class of commercial and industrial assessments have an average sales ratio of 76% of their market value. Do you see that language? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is, is that consistent with your understanding of uh, how the commercial industrial sector was doing prior to the 2018 revaluation of that non-residential sector? Uh, I can't. I can't verify this. Uh, I can only verify the study that I made, which I alluded to. Okay. And the goal for the 2018 revaluation was to bring all the non-residential values up to 100% of fair market value, correct? Correct. Right. All right. And the result of that in the tax year 2018-2019 would be that the residential properties would remain at their 2006 assessed values. Is that correct? They would remain at the current values uh, since 2006. Uh, we've had a lot of new construction, uh, and those values have come on board. Uh, I'm not sure if those were at the same the same rate, using the same methodology as 2006. Fair point. Let me ask you the question this way. In the tax year 2018-2019, the residential sector would remain at their pre-revaluation values. Right. Okay. Whereas the, and, and, um, and I think you testified earlier that those values were below market value. Right. <clears throat> and um, in that 2018-2019 year, while the, non, while the residential properties remained at pre-revaluation values, the non-residential properties would be revalued and would be up to, ideally, 100% of fair market value. Right. Okay. From a, a proportional standpoint, because the non-residential sector increased while the residential sector did not, would you agree that that meant the non-residential sector would shoulder proportionally a greater share of the tax burden that year? Yes, that year. Now let's talk about the 2019 revaluation. The 2019 revaluation, which you just completed, was focused on the residential properties. Right. Right. And the goal, again, was to bring those up to 100% of fair market value. All right. Now, <clears throat> are you familiar with the KRT website? I've seen it. Okay. Um, it has a link, just so you know, to the 2019 new values for residential mm -hmm. assessments. And it has all the prior values and the new values. And I'll represent to you that when you add together all the old values and add together all the new values and take the ratio between them, uh, you come up with 81%. In other words, the, uh, according to that calculation, that the original, uh, the, the pre-revaluation values for residential property was about 80% of the post-revaluation values. Does that calculation sound like we're in the right ballpark from your perspective? Yes. Okay. Kelly, are you saying, are you saying that it's gone up Pre to post twenty percent. Uh, I am saying that it went up pre to post from eighty percent to one hundred percent, which mathematically is not the same as going up by twenty percent. True, that twenty percent span. It's going up by twenty yeah. percent span. So maybe doing yes, yeah. exactly. Thank you for that clarification. And so the the town has implemented with some adjustments those new values for the 2019 2020 tax year, correct? Correct. And so now, theoretically, all properties across town are at 100% of fair market value. Or close to it. Or close to it. Right. And which means that the non-residential properties 
will now be shouldering less of the tax burden proportionally than it did in tw than they did in 2018 2019 correct in fact their taxes went down right, right. okay now you know of course that the law forbids unjust discrimination and uh, is it fair to say that you would not, as the assessor, you would not be putting into place the new residential revaluations if you believe that those unjustly discriminated against residential property owners? I would not what? You would not be putting into place the new residential valuations if you believe that those unjustly discriminated against residential property owners. Objection. That is unduly speculative. That that's asking for legal conclusions from a witness. I don't think so. I think that what we're talking about is a, a gentleman who has years of experience in taxation. He knows exactly what unjust discrimination looks like. And he made the decision to put into place the residential revaluations, these new values. And my question to him is, well, you want to do that if you believe that they were unjust discrimination. I'm going to what he believed and the reasons for his decision, not a legal conclusion. I don't really know how objections work in it's this a, context. It's not a, it's the same as a trial. Yeah, yeah no, no, no we're, we're very- Can you just answer the so question now or? Dave, if you can answer no. it, answer it. If you can't answer it, you can't answer it. It's up to you. The chair rules on objections, so. Do, I don't actually see that in the rules of procedure. That's generally the way that's, the administrative that's procedure That's parliamentary okay. precept. So, should I ask the question again? Yeah. You would not put into place, Mr. Buffard, the new residential valuations if you believe that they unjustly discriminated against all the residential property owners in Scarborough. Is that correct? Is that a trick question? <laughs> yes, it's not. Because I believe that you wouldn't. <laughs> You would not try to discriminate against the residential no, property. it's not my intention to discriminate against anyone. And if it was your belief that the new residential revaluations constituted undue discrimination, you wouldn't put them into place. Correct. The town chose this to do the revaluation in two different steps was your testimony earlier, correct? Yeah. It chose to do the non-residential first, then the residential. There was nothing preventing the town from doing things in the reverse order, correct? In other words, doing it residential first and then non-residential. There was nothing preventing the town from doing that. Is that correct? No, there was nothing preventing us, but there was a need, more of a need to update the commercial values instead of doing the residential first. Understood. But you could have chosen, you didn't choose, which is fine, but you could have chosen to do residential first, then non-residential. I could have, but I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, and you could have chosen, but you didn't, to implement all the new valuations in the same year. Um, can the attorney for the assessor not prompt the assessor? I wasn't speaking to him. I was no. actually. Okay. I'm sorry. I couldn't see your face, so I wasn't sure. I was not prompting him. Thanks. Can you trace that? Sure. Ah. There was nothing preventing you from implementing the revaluations for residential and non residential in the same year. In fact, it was feasible. Except, except oh. I didn't do them in the same year. Understood. But it was feasible to have done the revaluations for non-residential in 2018, and then do the revaluations for residential in 2019, and implement them all in the 2019-2020 year. That would be possible. Did you say, Dave, did you say that would be possible or impossible? Possible. Possible. Thank you. Do you happen to know off the top of your head what the mill rates were for some tax years, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019? I have the values here in case you need prompting. If I prompt you, will you remember them? 
Well, if I prompt you, will that help you recall whether they are correct or not? No. Okay. I was not here. I'm, I apologize. You've been here for two years. Wh which, which year were you first here again? 2018. Thank you. So in 2018, does it sound correct that the mill rate was 16.49? Yes. And that in this year, it's gone down to 14.7? Yes. And going back to the prior year, does it sound correct that the 2017 mill rate was the same at 16.49? Yes. Great. <clears throat> now, according to Town Exhibit 8, which is the summary done by KRT appraisal, the increase in value, I'm looking at the third paragraph here down towards the bottom, the increase in value for the non-residential sector was $247.7 million. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. And to, I, w I wanted to calculate how many, what, what amount of property taxes would be raised by that increase. So I'll tell you the math, and you can tell me if I did it correctly. I took that number, the 247 and change, million, and I divided it by 1,000, I multiplied it by 16.49. Does that sound like I did the math right? Okay. Okay, and I came out with a number of $4,084,957.22 in increased property taxes resulting from that increased revaluation. Does it sound like we're in the right neighborhood for numbers there? Color with that number again, please. <clears throat> Four million eighty-four thousand nine hundred and fifty-seven dollars and twenty-two cents. And again, what I did is I took the increased in, in valuation, yeah. multiplied by sixteen point four nine, divided by thousand. Let's assume, for the purposes of these questions, that I did the math correctly, which is always a dangerous assumption, but we're going to use it for right now. That additional $4 million in property taxes was paid entirely by non-residential property owners. Is that correct? That's correct. And if the town had not increased the non-residential valuations and had left them at the prior levels, and if the town wanted to raise that $4 million in property taxes, it would have had to increase the mill rate to have done so. That right. And that would have increased residential property taxes for, the, for that year. Now let's talk about your perspective on whether discrimination happened here. I want to make sure I understand your perspective. You testified that the non-residential sales after the revaluation showed a ratio of 79% of fair market value. Based, based on this... Uh study that I did. And you're talking about Town Exhibit 10? Correct. And you testified that residential sales during and prior to 2018 were at 80%. And that's, uh, let's see. Five. Town Exhibit 6. Six percent in prior years, right? right? Is it your view that there's no discrimination here because the com the, the ratio for non-residential at seventy nine percent and the ratio for residential at eighty percent are pretty daggone close? They appear to be based on this um, limited study. And is that the basis for your belief that there's no discrimination here? It's not the basis. Of I'm going to object one more time because unjust discrimination is a legal conclusion. He doesn't testify to that. He's answered the question. I can keep on going. Yep. You have a question? More questions? He's still, um, the assessor's still putting your case on. You're, answer, you're asking questions to what he's presented so far to David. Yes. Okay.
And so Town Exhibit 10 is labeled commercial sales post revaluation, correct? Correct. Who prepared Town Exhibit 10? I did. And what were you trying to show with Town Exhibit 10? I was trying to look at sales as they compared to the new assessments. To determine what the ratio would be? Just to get an overall picture of what has happened with sales and, and the new assessments. Does Town Exhibit 10 contain all of the non-residential sales after the revaluation took place? Up, up, to, uh, up to the time when I did it. So would that be April of 19? Yes. So between, so this runs from February of 2018 to April of 19, correct? Right. That's eight sales. So it's your belief that there were only eight sales of commercial pro of non-residential property in that time period? That's all that we could find. I have some documents to show the witness, which I'm going to ask to be admitted as exhibits. These are exhibits that I did not provide to the board 14 days in advance. Right. These they are purely by nature of rebuttal exhibits. They are purely responding to the town's exhibits and to Mr. Bufard's testimony today. I didn't know until we were sitting here whether I would need them or not. I brought the requisite number of uh, exhibits for the board. May I hand them up to the board? Um. Well, we have that we have that requirement so we can have the information prior to and so we can look at it and um, understand it Let's, well if I allow it then um, you know all we're trying to get as at, at the bottom line we're trying to get the whole story here in a formal way. we're not a courtroom floor in, in the courtroom so um, I can allow it we just need to take a look at it and, and interrupt this proceeding and it will take longer. That's the whole purpose of trying to get stuff, the, your information in prior to and not why, well, however you want to use it, from a rebuttal or informational or for wasting trees. It doesn't matter to us. If you're going to use it, we need to see it. Uh, understood. And it's good that you brought the requisite copies. Um, are, are we phone. talking a page or two so we have time to read it? Or are we talking uh, uh, an abundance? So these are part? almost all tax cards, property tax cards, and there's a number of them. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I want to talk to the board about the properties that were included on Town Exhibit 10 and the properties that were not. Just public hearing open for another meeting. One option is to keep the public hearing open um, and allow the board and the assessor's office an opportunity to review these. I know you're trying to get them in as rebuttal. I've seen that done before with this board, but it's asking an awful lot if, if there's several of them for them, this board and the assessor, to digest those documents to figure out what what they're saying and if they really are saying what you say they're saying. So that's hard to do that on right. the fly. It's unfair to the, to, to the assessor, in my opinion. We, we had a lot to digest to begin with, right? I mean, this is... Yeah. And and now you're you're asking us to take a look at some more documents. I, I think it's to to thrust it upon them, and they need to verify those sales and whatever the tax guys are. We need it's it's something that I think we need to. Um, sure, I can away. represent to the the board. These exhibits are simply the same tax cards, the same types of tax cards as in Exhibit One, Town Exhibit One, straight off of their website, with the exception of a single summary spreadsheet that is somewhere down here towards the end. And I think that if uh, the board will give me the leeway to walk the assessor through the questions for these, it actually will not take super long. I don't have very many questions on each one. It's just that there are multiple properties. So my question is, those cards are already in the information we have here? No, they are not. Oh, they're not. Uh, because the these cards... Format. Oh, the same format. <laughs> it's the same format. These yeah. cards are for the properties that are the subject of this right. application. Whereas you have sales. Those are sales. 
Right. Yeah, and it directly some, calls into question the conclusions that the assessor has made. Sometimes there's a backstory on sales, you know, whether they're arm's length. And there's the, always a backstory. Yeah, well, well so most often, I mean, it's, you know, um, you know, is it arm length? Is it, uh, you know, I mean, we, we don't know. Closure is a, you know, right. Is it a, right. So my, my point is also, this seems to be something that you would bring up during your presentation and it less has to do with question to the assessor and more has to do with presenting your case. And, and right now, I want to, we haven't had the, the assessor present their whole case yet and you have questions on what he presented. To rebut some of those things, I think might be more beneficial during your presentation. As long as I can continue to examine him, uh, Mr. Buffard, during my presentation, I'm fine with that because he's the one who can speak to the properties that were chosen for Town Exhibit 10. Um, and so I'm happy to defer that question until it's kind of uh, my turn, as it were. I, I, I am attempting, his presentation relies on Town Exhibit 10, and I have concerns about Town Exhibit 10. No, I want to make sure this board that. understands. Um, my, my, my other, the, the bigger issue is, is those sales that you want to present to us today, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think to, to open that up and just to let them come in right now as a rebuttal or however you want to do it is not fair to the assessor's side. They need to digest those. That's in vice versa. You know, if they want to present something on, to you and you haven't had a chance to review it, you probably wouldn't appreciate that. You know, that's why we have the, we, we, the, the rules state fairly clearly that we want information 14 days. 14 days and, and just to be clear, <clears throat> my game plan coming into this hearing was to actually not need any exhibits because we've got the tax cards for these properties. It's purely a legal argument. It's only when I received the town's exhibits and began examining them and looking into the data that supported them, which is contained in these exhibits here, yep. that I began to have additional concerns about the uh, validity <coughs> of the conclusions that are being presented to this board by the assessor. And when you received the town's e exhibits, you didn't have time enough to prepare, to send something into from, to the town on your behalf for those cards? N not before 14 days, and I finished compiling these today, actually. Um, so. Theoretically, I could have done it earlier because, of course, Attorney Cassiaficus provided me with his uh, exhibits by the 14-day deadline, but I simply didn't have the time to dig in and recognize <coughs> what was going on here. Well, I think it just puts, again, it puts the, the assessor's office in a, um, a position where, I mean, if I, was, if I was in either one of your positions and I, and I got that information, I'd want to be able to review it and verify it and see what the story is behind it, and you can say there's... 20 more sales there that, that totally dispute this, this thing here. And that might be your contention. But if that is your contention, you should have got us that, whether it's 14 days before, or even if it was seven days before, the, we oftentimes were very, le were very liberal on that, on that number, on that time frame. But we need it ahead of time, not during the proceeding. But, That's I, my point. Yeah, I can understand the reason. So I don't think that. it should be used to, to refute the assessor's findings if we don't have a, if we haven't had a chance to review it. So, what was the, what's so, the option to? Well, this is a fairly complicated case, believe it or not. I mean, yeah, no, I discrimination that. is a is a kind it's of a tough good. case to get your head around to, uh, sometimes, and um, so one option is to keep the public hearing open or keep the proceedings open and finish up and go as far as you can tonight, but allow uh, the next night, whenever that might be, for the assessor to come in and respond as they see fit. And you'll have the opportunity by then, of course, to review things in more detail on your own. And that's an option. Another option is to just straight out exclude it. Uh, well, I'm less likely to straight out exclude it, because I think if it's important information that works, we should, we should have it. It's just a timing issue for me. I, I don't that. think it's appropriate to just to thrust it on here in the midst of the halfway through a, a proceeding to say, well, I've got some information that's going to dispute this, but I haven't bothered showing it to you until now. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, given that um, contention, so, what would we do? Well, I think you, again, um, finish up with all the testimony that can be had tonight. Without so, those. Without those. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, assess at that time and then uh, 
talk to Tracy about, you know, we're, we're coming back anyway. Um, yep. So. Why don't we do that? Okay. So you can keep them in your, in your bag and then proceed in with your questions and continue with the hearing and then um, provide those after. We'll, we'll have to have another uh, date. I think we might be coming back on Thursday here. You can provide them now and then we have them. Uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. And then we can, you know. Okay. All right. So. <clears throat> I think the rest of my questions for Mr. Buffard relate to those additional exhibits. Okay. So I think that. Um, but he's not done, so you might have further questions. No, I thought he was. I thought Mr. Buffard was done. Well, he's done direct. He's now well, examined him. Right. Now I have a couple of questions. I should say Jim's not done presenting his case. F fair enough. So I think that's all the questions I have for Mr. Buffard this time, and then we will reopen those questions on down the line. Fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Buffard, go back to uh, let's go back to Exhibit Five again. This is something that we put together. That's residential sales, July 2016, December 2017. Yes. Okay. And what you found at that point, I believe you testified earlier, is that on average, the assessed value to sales value on residential properties during that time period, 2016, 2017, was 86 percent. 86. And at about the same time period, under your exhibit four, with regard to commercial and industrial or non-residential properties, as we're calling them now, uh, the assessment to sales ratio was 67 percent. That's what I found. Okay. So if it were, if the non-residentials were at 67 percent, and the residentials at the same time were at above 80 percent, 86 percent. Would the residentials be paying a greater, shouldering a greater burden of the tax for that year? They would. For 2016, 2017. Right. Is that a fair Correct. statement? Yes. And with regard to which year or which sector to re, uh, to revalue first? non-residential or residential. That was not your decision, correct? Correct. And that's all I have for Mr. Bart. <clears throat> I could, oh, sorry. May I have a couple of follow-up questions for Mr. Buffard based on that? Absolutely. Mr. Buffard, um, with reference to Town Exhibit uh, 5, which is the residential sales that shows 86%, how did you, did, are you the one who compiled this exhibit as well? Yes. And how did you decide what properties to include upon this exhibit? Well, they should include all of the residential sales that occurred during that period. Did you exclude any of them for any residential sales for any reason, such as not being at arm's length or any other? If I knew they were not at arm's length, yes, I would exclude them. And do you recall if you actually excluded any based on that reason? I, I can't give you any specifics, no. Okay. Um, and so is it your testimony that uh, your effort was, your goal was to include all property, all sales that fell in this time frame, unless you knew that they were right. not an arm's length transaction? Right. That's, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And uh, is that true? And we've got, uh, let's see, Town Exhibit 6, Residential Sales 2018. Did you compile this as well? Yes. And again, was it your goal to include all commercial sales that happened in that time frame? Residential sales? Thank you. No. no. Non uh, com commercial? Are you saying, are you saying six number is six? Residential. Six is residential. And what did I say? Commercial? Six is residential. Thank you. So, yes, Town Exhibit 6, was it your intention to include all residential sales in that spreadsheet? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. That's all I've got. Okay. Uh, any, yes. 
Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, exhibit four for commercial sales and exhibit 10 for commercial sales. Um, there are, well, like the very first item on exhibit 10 is 29 Washington Avenue, which also appears on um, exhibit four. But, and the sale price is the same, but the assessment price isn't the same. And I'm just trying to understand that. And I'm sure. Because the assessment is post revaluation. Okay, so the 827 assessment, the $827,000 assessment that's on exhibit four is prior to the reval? So that one's prior and this is post. Yeah. Um, if it's sold post revaluation, I, I guess I just can't get my head around it. If, if these items on exhibit 10 are all post revaluation, but then you included it on the one that's prior to revaluation? I just didn't expect it to be the same items. I thought this exhibit four was prior to reval and exhibit 10 were sales post reval. I mean, that's what I, that's what I thought they were until I realized that there's a crossover. Audrey, what, no, what property are you? Oh, uh, the very first one on Washington. exhibit 10, no, 29, 29 Washington. Washington. Okay. Well, so I, I'm, I'm just. Washington sold in April of 2018. I was using the prior assessment for that comparison. In Exhibit 10, 29 Washington Avenue, I was using the new assessment for comparison. Okay. Um, there's, there's several on here that are on both exhibits, and I'm just my thought process when I saw these without looking at every address was that exhibit four were all properties that were prior to revaluation and that's where we got 67 and then exhibit 10 was post revaluation and that's where we got 79 percent <clears throat> so they sold and you use the old assessed value on one page and use the new assessed value on the other okay so it, it, they sold, the, it's crossover in the time they sold. That's all it is. It's, it's right. the time they sold is included because it's 2018. Exhibit four included commercial sales that sold within a three or four year period, 2015 to 2018, based on the older assessments. It shows what, what the, the ratio was based on the old assessments. Uh, <clears throat> exhibit 10 shows what the ratios were based on the new assessments. And that was only for sales in 2018 and 2019. Well, the, I Up think Exhibit 4 stops with 2018, so it would only be a few items. I don't... Uh, yeah, and, 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 and these sales uh, went up to April of 2019. And that was, the reason it stopped there is because that's when I received the abatement request uh, from uh, Oak Hill Holdings, and I wanted to see how the new, how the new assessments were doing in comparison to sales. Okay. All right, that, that explains it though. It's just those few properties that were early 2018 that are gonna be on both sheets using the old assessment to show on exhibit four and using the new assessment on exhibit 10. But it's just those early 2018s. I only found a couple. I mean, I just, um, you know, like 321 US Route 1. And, I mean, there's a few, but not that many. Yeah, I, I had noticed those too, and I questioned the same thing at first and then realized that it was just a way of showing the I just the wanted to clarify that, I, that my process here, read, that I'm reading the forms correctly. Thank you. 
Okay, so basically, 29 Washington Avenue, we're using that one in, it was, it was assessed at eight eight hundred twenty seven thousand. It sold for one point two million. At, and that, so the assess so that ratio is sixty four percent. Then on ten, he shows the same sale, right? Mm -hmm. One point two nine five, and then has the new assessment. Mm -hmm. So that new assessment now is seventy nine percent as opposed to the old one of sixty four percent. Okay. Any other other questions? Yep. Anybody else? Any more? So far. Um, Jim, I just have a quick one. You said that uh, you asked David whose decision was to evaluate commercial first versus residential. Right. He said it wasn't his decision. Correct. Whose was decision was it? I'd like to call the next witness. There you go. Right. What a segue. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Hall, if you could please state your name for the record. Yes, Thomas Hall. And your position with the town of Scarborough? Town manager. How long have you served as manager of the town? It'll be 11 years next month. As Scarborough Town Manager, when did you first become aware of any issues regarding the, the, uh, the assessed value and sale price being uh, less than 100 percent? Almost immediately upon my hire, I realized that it was an issue. So what did you do? Well, uh, worked with the assessor at the time and consulted with town council to come up with a strategy. Uh, a, a town of this size, uh, this is quite a, an expensive and time-consuming undertaking. So it, it's something that requires further thought and strategy, uh, strategy with others. <clears throat> Did the town try to uh, undertake a revaluation earlier in the decade? Yes, in fact, we put a, a question out to the voters in 2014 to fund a full town-wide revaluation. Unfortunately, that, uh, that was not successful. What happened? Uh, the voters turned it down by a margin of two to one almost. Okay, and that would be the minutes of the town council meeting of November 5, that it's exhibit seven, where they certified the election results? Yes. Why did that have to go to the voters? Scrubber Town Charter requires uh, matters to be financed um, above $400,000 requires voter approval. And so that was rejected <clears throat> by the voters. Um, so what happened next? Well, we certainly um, continue to appreciate that we had a challenge, uh, uh, continue to track our sales on an annual basis as required, um, and talked fairly continuously about the next plan, how to move this thing forward. What wound up? being the plan to move this forward? Well, in the years following the failed vote, uh, for, a number of, uh, for a number of reasons, I went through assessors uh, fairly regularly, uh, almost on an annual basis, it seemed. Uh, for a number of very good reasons, folks moved on to different positions. And so I lacked the stability uh, in those years following the failed vote uh, to really put together a solid plan. I, I've been through one of these before in a previous community, appreciated and have a deep appreciation for the amount of staff involvement and the need to have uh, you know, solid leadership to see a process through and was not about to bring it forward without the comfort that I had leadership in place. But by 2018, you were putting a plan in place, or the town was putting a plan in place. By the fall of uh, 2017, uh, Mr. Buffard agreed to come on as assessor. I believe he started in December of 2017. We immediately went about the business of uh, figuring out how to move this forward and move it forward quickly. In fact, these were detailed discussions that he and I had uh, about bringing him on uh, in terms of what the next couple of years would look like. And so how did, how did the town decide to go forward with a partial revaluation? Well, we certainly could have gone back out to the voters or we could have found other ways to fund uh, this effort. Uh, it was about a $500,000 expense. Um, the council at the time really wanted to make some progress and uh, I was permitted to bring a proposal before them in early 2018 that would uh, accomplish this in two steps. First being uh, commercial industrial, um, really based on the fact that the data was overwhelming, that that was the area of our tax base that was uh, more, more, more inequitable than the, than the rest, I'll, I'll say. Beyond that, there are practical limitations of cost and timing to accomplish uh, the amount of work required. And uh, it was not 
feasible for us to even consider doing residential in the spring of 18 uh, with any hope of having it, having it accomplished for the commitment that August. So in February of 2018, the council then entered into a contract with KRT, uh, or actually in March, entered into the contract with the council appropriated $77,850 for that uh, commercial industrial revaluation. Yes, we conducted uh, a solicitation and RFP process, identified two different vendors, uh, had firm pricing, and that was the basis for my proposal that I brought to the council in February of 2018. Uh, they did authorize funding, and with that authorization, I then was able to consummate the contract. And that's Exhibit 9, the Assessor's Exhibit 9. At the back of that exhibit, appended to those minutes, is a, a memorandum from you to, to the Council, as I understand it, about that revaluation. Is that correct? Yes. And this explains the reason uh, why it should be done and why to do that in two phases? Yes, I uh, was acutely aware of the, the different, all the different elements and uh, the complexity of the proposal, so I, I tried to lay it out in as uh, systematic and easy to understand methodology as I could. How many commercial and industrial or non-residential properties are there in the town of Scarborough? Uh, the exact number escapes me, but it's in the order of 900 properties. How many residential properties are there? About 8,800. Is that a factor in deciding to go with the uh, revaluation of commercial industrial first? As I testified a moment ago, that went into kind of the practical considerations of physically accomplishing this work. Um, a revaluation process uh, includes in-field uh, inspection of property. Um, on the commercial industrial side, there are often uh, detailed uh, income analysis that go along with that and so uh, it certainly did loom large in that conversation in, in addition to the inequality that you talked about earlier correct that was the first thing that um, indicated that we should uh, try to deal with the, the largest inequities first and then uh, and then the practical realities of that being within our capabilities uh, the council was very clear in wanting to address this as quickly and uh, systematically as possible. And so as part of this, did you uh, in, intend and anticipate revaluing the residential properties in the following year? Yes, that was part of my proposal in that memo uh, in Exhibit 9. Um, I made it very clear and I was pleased the Council agreed that if we chose to, to take this approach, uh, that we should as quickly as possible thereafter uh, move forward and complete the residential component. And. Uh, the town did the town hire a, a company to undertake the residential revaluation we did uh, again our RP process identified two uh, potential uh, there were two proposers uh, we ultimately selected KRT from Haverhill Mass and that revaluation has been performed it has and those new values, as Mr. Bluepart had testified earlier, are now in place as of April 1, 2019 for the residential side, correct? Correct. That's all that I have. Question? Um, just, just so I to clarify this, so um, on the, since I asked the question, I guess, initially, uh, the the initial funding for the appraisal, for the commercial appraisal, was how much? 77,950. 77, and you went to the, the town authorized that, right? Yes, town council authorized and, use of, and of fund balance. Who performed that? KRT performed both commercial industrial and. And then subsequently, you, they did the town council approve more funds for the KR up to whatever that number was? Yes, I made it a. Uh, component of my budget proposal that's for spring of 18 and the council um, actually appropriated monies to complete the residential component um, and the decision was made to start with on the commercial sector because of the uh, there are larger inequities in the valuation as, as uh, David points out some of his um, um, 
exhibits here. I guess one question I have, um, if, I guess maybe David, this is not your question. So the last evaluation we had was 2005. Correct. Correct. I remember that. Um, but didn't we have some more evaluations subsequent to that? I believe in 2012, uh, Paul Lesperance uh, made some adjustments or uh, changed some values in the waterfront. Yeah, we, we had revaluation of Trout's Neck, Higgins Beach, yes, and Pine Point. I remember being here for those, yeah. right? So we didn't. We did do a sector yes. of a revaluation, mm -hmm. much like a a commercial sector. We did a we did a sector Flags. of a sector. A we, we did a, we did a uh, waterfront affected sector of the residential first right. in 2012. 13? 2012. 2012. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I can speak to that not as assessor but as manager, and I have. Uh, unfortunately, intimate knowledge of that, uh, given the fact that we continue to uh, litigate um, yeah. those very values. So uh, you're exactly correct. Uh, former Assessor Lesperance did a what I'll characterize as a partial revaluation of three different waterfront communities in town. Okay. Um, that's all I have right now, Greg. And Kelly, I suppose you might have a few questions. How did you guess? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kelly McDonald for the applicants. <clears throat> um, Mr. Hall, good evening. Uh, would you agree with uh, Mr. Buffard that the goal, the ultimate goal of the two steps of the revaluation process was to bring all properties up to 100% of fair market value? Certainly, or as close there too. Yeah. And it, it's your position, as stated in your memo, that all sectors, residential and non-residential, were well below fair market value prior to the two-step revaluation process. Yes, very clearly the data supported that. I appreciated your explanation of the reasons for the choices that were made by the town. It was possible for you to have done things in the reverse order, though. You could have done residential first and then the non-residential uh, revaluation. That would have been possible, is that correct? It could. Have, it, it, it is certainly possible. It is illogical, frankly, in my view. Okay. Um, and it would it, have been... And, uh, I should offer, I should have mentioned earlier, but I think it's appropriate to bring it up here. Uh, around the same time we are having these conversations, uh, we were comforted somewhat uh, through, through the law court's decision uh, regarding a matter that still, in fact, was heard again before them last week, uh, in which um, the law court, though they certainly suggest that town-wide revaluations are the best method of uh, equal apportionment, they certainly don't preclude uh, adjusting assessments for selected properties or, or using my terminology, a partial revaluation. After all, the goal is rough equality. And to your question, sir, um, moving forward with those, that class of properties that th is furthest from market, um, I think speaks to trying to achieve rough equality. The law court also said in that decision, isn't that correct, that you could do a partial evaluation so long as you were making things more equal. And I believe we did that. Based on Town Exhibit 10? What's the basis for your belief that you made things more equal with the partial revaluation of the non-residential sector? I can't speak to Exhibit 10. I didn't create it. That's fine. I asked a different question. You can skip that question. I'm just going to ask what the basis for your belief. You just testified, I think, that you believe that you made things more equal with the 2018, and I think you were referring to the 2018-2019 
partial revaluation of the non-residential sector. Is that what you were referring to? I believe that was that was my understanding that, that your question was directed toward that. And so what's the basis for your belief that that partial revaluation made things more equal? The ratios analysis that we've done post non-residential revaluation suggests that we're much closer to market value. Okay. Do you think that um, the uh, those ratio calculations showed that in 2018 and 2019 the uh, ratios for the residential sector and the non-residential sector were roughly equal? I'm sorry, I don't follow your question. I'm focusing in on the 2018-2019 tax year when the first step of the revaluation process had taken place. Okay. So at this point, the non-residential sectors had been revalued, the residential had not. We're on the same page. Yes. Is it your view, based on the ratio studies that were conducted, that there was rough equality between those two types of properties during that tax year? No. Okay. Please elaborate. My comment relates to uh, comparison within the class. Okay, so you think that there was not rough equality between the residential and the non-residential sectors of properties in the 2018-2019 tax year? I don't feel qualified to answer that question. I don't. Okay. Can I speak? I have no. no idea, but my <laughs> guess is yes. <laughs> so it's uh, probably up to the chair. If you ask you a question, I suppose you can. The, uh, the, the ratio of 67% for commercial was performed for the years 2015 through 2018, or into 2018. The residential ratio of 86 was for 2016 and 2017 leading up to the time period when the decision was made to go ahead with the revaluation. The ratio of 80% for residential was performed in 2018 after the commercial reval had begun. Prices were increasing, residential prices were increasing, and therefore the ratio was dropping during 2018. Can I now ask him a question? We're kind of going a little out of order, but Mr. Buffard, so uh, is it your view that because in 2018 the residential ratio was at 80% and the commercial ratio was at 79%, at least as shown by Town Exhibit 10? I, that there I was, can't speak to that 79%. Do you I, believe that there was rough equality in the tax year 2018-2019 between residential and non-residential? Yes. What's the basis for that belief? Because the commercial uh, reval had, we had done the commercial reval to bring it up close to 100%, and the and the residential reval was in the 80s. And do you believe it's, that there's a rough equality between a 100% ratio and an 80% ratio? Uh, that's a matter of opinion. What is your opinion as to that? My opinion, yes, there is. There was rough equality. Even though the residential and were, we were... We were moving, the next step was to move the, the residential values up to or close to 100%. I understand. Nobody's quarreling with whether there was rough justice, rough equality, once both steps were put into place. I'm just focused on after step one and before step two. And at that point, you, I believe, have testified that residential was about 80% and the non-residential was at 100%. I'm going to jump in here. And one so more time question. object, because the notion of rough equality is a test the court applies to the facts that are found to determine whether or not unjust discrimination has occurred. He's not a court. This board is making the determination of whether there was rough equality based upon those documents, based upon the numbers that have been given to you, the dates that have been given to you, the situation that's been described. It's a legal conclusion as to whether there's rough Quality and whether it's unjust discrimination. Neither witness is able to answer that question. I actually think that Mr. Attorney Cassiopeus's witnesses are highly qualified to answer this question with their background in tactics, but I am prepared to move on from those questions. Thank you.
Um, back to Mr. Hall. We were talking about what was possible. It was, there was nothing preventing the town, is this statement correct? There was nothing preventing the town from doing the non-residential revaluations in year one and then doing the residential revaluations in year two and putting them all into effect in year two instead of putting the non-residential into effect in year one. Nothing preventing, no, but as I stated earlier, uh, that is illogical to me. Uh, ignorance is bliss, but with the information in hand, it seems to me um, it's only appropriate to implement those values. Okay. And uh, would you agree that you would not permit the residential revaluation to have gone forward if it constituted discrimination against the residential property owners? Seems to me you've asked the same question of the assessor. Yes. And for my benefit, can, can you recall for me what his response was? I, I believe his response was that he would not have allowed to go, let it go forward if it constituted discrimination. I think his response was that he wouldn't let, he wouldn't discriminate on any property. Anyone. Yeah, fair enough. I, I would share the same opinion. What, how much did the residential revaluation cost the town? Yes, yeah, something in the order of $360,000. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Nothing. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I, ju I just need clarification. We have. Um, we don't have a lot of apples to apples here with the dates. And so I'm having a little problem when, when one exhibit is from 15 to 18 and one is from 16 to, you know, I mean, they're just not good apples to apples comparisons. They're not taking the same exact tax years for commercial and residential. So I just want to clarify, we had a 67% ratio on sale of commercials on one of these documents and an 86% on residential so basically a 20% difference and so I'm just clarifying that that's why commercials were done first is because they were so far below market and so when they came up and then you checked they were at 79% so they still weren't as high as resident residential at 86 so there was still an equality as far as commercial being less than residential Am I reading these forms correctly to say that, Mr. Bouchard? Uh, that, that sample of eight sales was, mm -hmm. was done prior to um, up until what, April? Of 19. Of 19, right. Uh, I did that comparison simply to see where we were with the commercial property. If you had achieved your 100% or close to it. Right. And and I'd say it, those particular examples show that you, you actually still were under market based, value. Based on the sales, we were still under Okay. 100%. And at that point, our residential was 80, and they were 79. So I would say that was roughly close. But even before that, the 86, it, it, and, and again, I just have a little problem because I can't say, oh, here's the 17, 18 year, and here's the 17, 18 year on the other one, you know, commercial versus residential, because they're all chopped up differently. And so that's the only struggle I have with making the comparisons. But to me, the, you know, if I'm saying this correctly, 67% ratio for commercial went up to 79. 86% residential dropped down to 80. So now you're at 79 and 80. And to me, you couldn't get much closer than that. So I just want to make sure I was reading this right because the dates are all kind of different. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's I see. I have a question. Yes. Um, question for the two lawyers. Uh, 
in your view, what does it take away from the Petrin case or any other cases about the town's ability to do a partial reval? I mean, how, how would you describe uh, the current status of the law? How would you describe the current status of the law? Jim, you want to start? Okay. The court clearly would prefer a town-wide revaluation, but it does not look unfavorably upon a partial revaluation when the goal is to try to achieve greater quality and equity in taxation. That's also what the U.S. Supreme Court cases say in this regard that, that are being relied upon by our state law court. Because what, one quick thing. Our, our case, this is a legal issue, really, rather than a factual issue. Well, we, we've gotten dragged into some legal issues. Well, I understand. <laughs> I, I understand. Unknowingly. So my question is, do you want us to address the legal issues tonight? Because there are a couple of outstanding legal issues in this. One of them is unjust well, I, so I think we need to be starting to, to think about it. And, well, and how do you want that presented? Do, you, uh, do I sum that up at the end of our presentation before turning, uh, turning over to Attorney McDonald? Or do you want us to... Uh, I think well, maybe we have some news at the end. Well, I, I know. I just wanted to, uh, actually, a quick snapshot of what you said on the Petra, not wrapping together all the facts and the law. I understand. Just a, a narrow question on But under Petra, I, I believe that under that case, a partial revaluation is, is fine under Maine law, where your, your goal is to try to adjust and to achieve greater equality of uh, evaluations. Kelly? So I'd be curious. So I'm in, I'm in rough agreement, uh, rough equality with Attorney Cassiopeus <laughs> uh, on his characterization of, of Petrin. As I read Petrin, if you have a situation where you have an undervalued group of properties, you can do a partial revaluation to bring them up to the level of the other. What you can't do is take them over, because that doesn't increase equality. Take them over what? So, sorry, I'm, I'm waving my hand, which right. is never idea, a good idea when I'm trying to make a record here. But if you have a group of properties, let's call it the non-residential group, mm -hmm. that is at 67% of market value, and a residential group that's at 80% of market value, Petron says you can do a partial revaluation to bring the non-residential up to 80%. But I think Petron also says you may not take that non-residential group and bump it up to 100%. Because then you are not increasing equality. You are exacerbating a situation by taking, by just assigning the inequality to somebody else. That is the problem with what happened here. On the procedural question that you raised, Mr. Chair, um, on when we should talk about the, the, the legal stuff, we're coming back to talk about these exhibits that I have later on. Um, and you will not be shocked to hear that they show ratios much higher than 79%. Just a little foreshadowing there. And so I would suggest that we get through what evidence we can today and then do one summary at the end of everything. Because as the, the record stands now, it'd be, it would be brought up to 79 versus 80, and you're saying there might be more that changes that. And I'd like to add one bit about Petrin because there's a little gloss on that. When you're looking at what you're measuring rough equality uh, if you're looking at rough equality in tax treatment of similarly situated property owners. That's quoting from the U.S. Supreme Court in the Allegheny decision. And, and so when, when you're looking at the class, the class here is non-residential, so it's commercial and industrial. And no one has said that there's any discrimination in the class. It's like within the class. protection analysis. That That's correct. Within the class, you're things. treating similarly situated people differently, not right. And in the Petrin case, was about some oceanfront people complaining about other oceanfront. Correct. People. And and so when you look at this case, the cases that followed Petrin and the U.S. Supreme Court cases that the Petrin is referring to, it's all instances in which there was discrimination, unjust discrimination, because. Similarly situated properties within the same class were treated differently. That's not the case here. And in fact, because of that, and, and because we're really just talking about, there are over 900 commercial industrial properties. There are, there are 15 people who have filed for an abatement. Do they even have standing? Is this really something where they have a, a particularized injury that's different from the rest of the public? 
the, the entire class is treated the same way that we evaluate it once. So that's why you know, there, there's a bigger, there's another issue besides unjust discrimination here. Did they, did they even have standing to bring this? I didn't see a standing argument in your materials, is there? I wasn't required to file a brief in advance. Right. <laughs> I filed exhibits, and, and that's what I did. And speaking of those exhibits, I think we need to get to the rest of them here. I so are, are you... I, I'm, I'm all set. I guess uh, at this point, I would move to have all of these exhibits admitted into this proceeding. Okay. I refer to each of them. Well, I think everything's already. Yeah, there. I mean, you don't really have to move. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I, Yeah, everything's already. Yeah. Surplus of caution. And Hard to break habits. It is. <laughs> so, um, I just want to say that there's an important piece of that legal analysis I disagree with. You'll be shocked to hear. After you agreed roughly with most everything else was fine. Yeah. Gotcha. Rough but, agreement. But yeah. here's you had rough agreement. But here's, here's the here's the key thing. You were careful with those words. Yeah, that's right. The, the what the Supreme Court said in Allegheny and what the law court said in Petrin was uh, there there you can tax different classes differently, but we're not actually talking about taxing different properties differently. We're talking about assessing different properties differently. And for that, we have to go to the main constitution. And the main constitution makes clear that taxes have to be apportioned and assessed equally according to just value. This is an assessment issue, not a tax issue. And that is a, that's the key distinction here. Is that a distinction without a difference? It's not. Because if you have assessing to- assessing something, <clears throat> aren't, if you're assessing it differently, are you ta uh, I, if you're assessing it, in effect, aren't you taxing it? No, because, because maybe you're applying the same mill rate as was done here. So you're taxing it identically here because every, the same mill rate is being uh, taxed across the board. But you're assessing differently. See? So it is, it is in fact, a distinction with, with a difference. difference. Yeah. Okay. You, you I, invited the lawyers to give their opinions <laughs> about the law. <laughs> Where yeah, is Derwin that? opened <laughs> the door. So. Uh, I'll get a, I'll get a yeah, I do too. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, for both uh, the city manager and city assessor, it, I have to make an assumption that you guys work with other city managers and other city assessors and associations, and that you come across um, people in your similar fields on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's kind of a, a vague question, but how often? Um, in your experiences, do other similar cities or towns of this size uh, make assessments uh, in a two-step process? Um, whether it because uh, financial burdens in the, in the given year or uh, manpower in the given year where one year well, you'll do one section and then the next year you'll do another section. Is, is that uncommon? Is that common? And I'd, I'd love to hear your full thoughts. I, I can't give you the specifics on, on how other communities do or have done their revaluations. I've had uh, discussions with assessors in this regard, and there's, there's mixed opinions. Yeah, I, I can't necessarily speak to uh, the commonality of it in other communities, I, although I, I'm aware that um, it is done, uh, particularly on the commercial industrial side. Uh, there are um, there's such a variation in diversity within that the, the, that class of properties. It's not uncommon for you know a consultant to come in and look at the retail component. Just to use an example of that class, given the fact that it's kind of unique, it, it reacts differently than the others in the class. And so uh, there are consultants that are well used in the state that really specialize, particularly in that commercial industrial side of, uh, of the tax base. And, and so that's making modifications within a class as opposed to doing the entire class all at once. Okay. Well, Tom, you, you had stated in this memo that you put, that, that uh, on page two, that yeah, I quoted, it's fairly common practice for communities to reevaluate different classes of properties at different times. I believe that's what I was just speaking to. I, I can't give you, you know, specifics of, of sure. who and when. No, but, but it does happen. Yes. You're saying. Yeah. Okay, so one more question. Yeah. Um, 
for you. As far as you talked about that step of um, if you're at 67, they need to come up to the, I think it was the 80, the 79 percent, and then is it realistic then to then take the 79 percent and then jump that up to 100, and then go back to the commercial and bring that up to 100? So there is a quality through that process. I think that um, my view of the law is that you can bring one group of properties up to another group of properties, but you can't raise it above the other group of properties because that creates inequality. So once both groups of properties were at the 80% level, you need to increase them both up to the 100% level at the same time, which is exactly why I've been asking the town, well, why didn't you just get the values in year one and year two and then put into effect in year two across the board? Because that's something that they could have done it's not a huge difference in the tax proceeds, and it would have been legal. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, related to that, um, you know, if we're looking at exhibits four and five and talking about the 67% commercial industrial versus an 86% residential, uh, and then, uh, to me, that's an obvious need to try to assess the commercial first because you've got about a 25% discrepancy right there. Uh, so I, I definitely understand. My question would be to Mr. Hall and Mr. Buffard. At any time in this, uh, in this process of evaluation, revaluation, did you ever say to yourselves, it's okay if we go a little bit over on the commercial side and, and go above that mean, that mean, because it'll make up for the lost time that we've had. My assumption is probably no, but uh, you know, I'd, I would like you to address that. I, I, you know, I'm guessing that you did not think that we were going to go back retroactively and kind of adjust this, the, the, the past discrepancy and past prejudice that had kind of been going on of having residential property owners taxed at a higher burden than commercial owners. I'll speak for myself and emphatically no. I mean, that would be counter to everything that this process is, is about. I, I suppose, uh, in all honesty, um, there's, uh, there has been a recognition that this class of properties has been um, less than market comparatively uh, for a long time. And so, arguably, they've been not paying their fair share um, by virtue of the tax rate being something different. And so I, I think that's that. At least that was part of the conversation uh, I heard among the town council. But to knowingly increase properties beyond what could be supported through the data, certainly not. Or even not. I'm I'm getting at even maybe not even knowingly, but just not being as I, I'm. How attentive do you feel you were to trying to really genuinely reconcile the imbalance? versus try to kind of catch it up, you know, and, and equalize from, an you know, over it. And, and I, I'm just trying to address, um, you know, Mr. McDonald's point of, uh, you know, I don't, based on what I'm seeing. I, because we chose to do a two-step process, uh, we knew we could not achieve, you know, re Perfection. reconcile the imbalance in a single year, but the goal was to do it, um, you know, back to back, if you will. The value of having an outside reevaluation firm is they come in, they employ the, the modern and appropriate mass appraisal techniques, uh, and for my purposes, uh, I have no role to play. Uh, the assessing process uh, should be immune from political or administrative uh, influence or oversight, um, and there's some comfort in having an outside independent perspective come in and um, do the analysis and come up with new values. With uh Changing with a change, uh, rapidly changing market that we've seen in the past few years. If we had simply brought the commercial industrial assessments up to match the residential, uh, it would have been like trying to hit a moving target, for one thing. And uh, so, we maybe we could have achieved that and and equalized the commercial industrial values to the residential values and then a short time after that uh, there would have been a discrepancy uh, caused by the market. <clears throat> so the next step would have been to bring the residential values up 
and then you and then again you'd be creating inequity and then the next step would have been to bring the commercial values up to 100 percent thereby creating inequity and then bringing finally bringing the residential properties up to 100 percent so we would have been caught in this in this ongoing process of of going back and forth to try to equalize both classes of properties uh, and the goal really w was to bring both classes up to 100 percent as soon as we could and follow-up question just do you believe that you could have achieved greater fairness in taking commercial numbers from 2018 and then taking residential numbers from 2019 and putting them into effect at the same time? In other words, there's appreciation in the market from 2018 to 2019 in the residential sector. And if you, there again, if you take the values of 2019's residential sector or, you know, and, and use those as assessment values, and you take a year prior in the commercial market, do you really believe that would have been effective or balanced or more fair if you implemented the change of assessed value at the same time? If they weren't taken, in other words, if you weren't gra gathering data from the same time period to make the change at the same time period, would that be, would that realistically be fair? Like I said, it's a moving target. Uh, the market is, has been changing rapidly and uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if we ever will get them to the point where they're both exactly at the same ratio. It's been our goal, but I don't know if we can get there. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got one more question, if yeah, it's possible. Sure, uh, I don't know if the town's attorney can answer this question. Uh, looking at it from completely the opposite angle, um, is it a possibility we could be sitting here under the same scenario with the process that took place, with, with commercial being uh, evaluated one year, residential the next year, with somebody from the residential end saying, because you did the two-step process, you, you basically defrauded the town adequate income because you didn't um, do it all at the same year. Um, is, is that a possibility we could be here under the exact reverse? Mr. McDonald could be here tonight representing residential landowners because we didn't put into effect the properties, uh, the, the property valuations that we sat on. I, I could see that happening. Thanks, if things had been reversed or if the numbers had been kept and tucked away for a year if, if residential had been done first or if it had been reversed. I'm not casting aspersions on Mr. McDonald. I'm just saying I, I might be here making a, the same argument on, on someone else's behalf from the other side if we'd done it the other way. And, 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 I don't, and feel free. I, I don't want to, you know, if you have an opinion on that same question, I'd, I'd like to hear it. Uh, thank you. No, I, I think that the discrimination by the residences is if we heard earlier that commercial industrial only made it up to 79 percent with the 2018 revaluation and so if that's true then pressing ahead with the residential revaluation and taking all those up to a hundred percent that's discrimination absolutely because you're pushing the ratio from 80 percent up to a hundred percent which is why at the end of this proceeding, I'm going to ask the board to conclude that, in fact, the industrial commercial did make it to 100% at 2018, while the residential was still lingering back at 80%, mm -hmm. and that difference is discrimination to the industrial folks. So I, I don't think you have a discrimination case if uh, they all got revalued at the same time. I think that's exactly the right way to do it. It's always going to be a snapshot in time. You're looking at all the properties over some span of time. You can never value properties simultaneously. I don't see it being a big deal at all to take commercial, industrial, non-residential in one year and residential in the next year. You know, it's a it's a 18 month process. That's that's fine. Of course, it's going to be a moving target. There's no discrimination there. The discrimination is when you deliberately choose to take one group and put it ahead of the other. 
so so the question is on the commercial if we were to do it this year and the residential next year and then change them both next year change them is, simultaneously is the residential saying well, why didn't you change the commercial last year because it would have brought the town more income if you already had the values why didn't you do it then why did you wait to this year I, I don't think that the, the residential folks would have a leg to stand on in that case because it's part of a comprehensive town-wide revaluation, which takes time, and all the values will be put into place once they are all settled on. If you think about it, there are probably individual houses that where the valuation was fixed in January of 2019 and other houses where the valuation were fixed in March of 20, sorry, 2019. January and March of 2019. That difference in time, as long as it's part of a comprehensive program, that's fine. Okay, thank you. I just want to correct one thing I heard Mr. Chamberlain say. Uh, I think twice you referred to the town being deprived of funds or some such thing. Just appreciate that revaluation is revenue neutral. The town receives no additional dollars as a result of it. It's a matter of distribution of, right. of tax burden. Correct, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Since timing has come into issue, the courts talk about there being uh, seasonably attaining equality, around equality. Uh, there is, there can be some delay. It doesn't have to be simultaneous. Well, I guess that goes to my question a little bit, and maybe because Kelly, you were talking about it. You know, we, we keep talking about this as a two-step process. It could be a, a one step process that just took a little bit longer, right? I mean, we didn't, there's not three years between commercial appraisal and the residential reappraisal, correct? We did them as quoting to what you, Tom, said back to back. I mean, we, so you, on a spectrum, you could say, yeah, we did, we did one first and the other secondly, but we did them in a continuum. The town did them in a continuum. Um, but I, Kelly, I have a, do have a couple questions for you. Um, and you're talking, when you're talking about unjust discrimination, are you suggesting that any partial valuation it represents unjust discrimination? No. But in no. this case you are. Yes. Because it, it caused the non-residential group to go well above the residential group in terms of that assessment ratio. All right, if so the partial bring, revaluation bring brings a, group, a segment up to 100%. Well, brings it up to the other segment. Like if everybody's at eighty percent, we're fine. No case, right. no claim. Right. But bringing one up to a hundred, and we and we're going to bring the other one up to a hundred. But by the mere fact of bringing it up to a hundred, your contention is to say that's unjust discrimination. Yes, sir. Even though we're bringing the other one up to a hundred, but we just a lagging behind that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole year of property taxes that that sector has to bear a disproportionate burden of. And, and what about um, Jim's point about what if we did sit on that one whole year of property taxes of the residential and, we, and it was done that way and we didn't implement that whole year. So we've got a whole year of just of, of waiting, right? And those aren't, so couldn't a case be made just for that case, okay, just like you said? Wouldn't that be appropriate? I, I, I don't think so, because I think that it's all part of a, a comprehensive program, the, the results of which are all going to be put into place. So why isn't it time. all part of a comprehensive program for the commercial, vis-a-vis -vis the residential? Solely because they decided to put into place some of the values early. Solely because they, they said, all right, non-residential, you guys get bumped up to 100%. All they needed to do was wait. So they were ready to put everybody up to 100%. Do you feel that the commercial sector, or in your words, the non-residential, um, was not an undervalued group of properties? Um, I'm trying to untangle your negatives. Yep. Do I think it? Do might I think be a, there might be a, deg a double negative in there? Do I think it was undervalued? Do, no. I'm like, yeah. Do you feel that this the non non the res the commercial? Then it's not a, not a double negative. If you feel that the commercial section of group of properties, do you feel that that was not an undervalued group of properties? We're, we're, not, we're not challenging the town's testimony that both residential and non-residential were undervalued. So you're saying, so that's a yes? Yeah. They you're were saying that it was undervalued? They were undervalued. Right. Everybody was undervalued. Right. Yeah. I, I, 
I don't know about those specific percentages. Because as I've referred to, I have some grave concerns about the calculation Granted. of Exhibit 10. Granted, right, right. But yeah. do you have a dispute about the not if you take a exhibit, exhibit 10 away? Yeah. Do you have a, a discrepancy or do you have a problem with the fact the the data in Exhibit 4 or 5? Uh, I, I don't have anything right here today. I haven't done that analysis though, and so. You know, we heard from the assessor that he put all the sales post revaluation mm -hmm. to exhibit 10. I, I think that that's not accurate, that I have dozens of sales that took place, almost all of which show a ratio well above 79%. I think he said that. But, put them and in. I haven't done that analysis okay. for the others. So, But you're talking about the exhibit 10. Things at this for the, point. Exhi the exhibit 10 is where my concern is focused. Right. For exhibits four, five, and six, I think they were. I haven't tried to dive into the database of the town and figure out if all the sales are represented in those sheets or not. So any concerns I have about those sheets are just because I have concerns about exhibit 10. So my only other question to you would be is that if, if for some reason you did crunch these numbers and you looked at all the sales and you looked at all the data and you saw that the numbers that are here are correct, mm -hmm. would you still be questioning the approach to start with revaluating the non-residential properties first? I, I would as a legal matter. So let's. So you're saying assume the 67 percent and the assume that there's a 25 percent difference in, in you know yes. value between them. And I absolutely understand the instinct to, to tackle the bigger problem first. Mm -hmm. I think that it violates the main constitution when you choose intentionally to assess one group of properties <coughs> at a ratio above another group of properties. And at face value, I would agree with you if there wasn't other supporting data to, to substantiate that that was the right course of action to take. So that's where we would probably will disagree. But I, I'm curious to see what you've got for other exhibits as well. And for, and for clarification, I think on Exhibit 10, I think the assessor <coughs> said something more to the point where that's all the sales that, that were Thank on that you. list up to that point when he did it. Well, not, he said not that's exist all total. That he for, for the period up of... Up to that April, whatever. Right, that for point. the period of February 18 through April of 19. Right, I just wanted to be clear on that. Not, not, not all of them. Yeah. That was yeah, my other... Yeah, he said all the ones that I found. So it, it, it didn't sound like it was an exhaustive list. I did, I Those did this after I received the abatement request uh, immediately after that. So it, it only went up to that time period. I didn't do any further studies after that. I'm sure, I, I know there are sales after that, but I that was when right. I did the study and that, that yep. was the extent of it. Yep. What were the sources of where you where you obtain the values of and the uh, numbers of sales? Um, property property uh, uh, declarations from uh, from the state. Transfer tax forms. Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay. Uh, and you're you're done. I'm done. So Kelly, you have. Uh, I'm so excited to show you these exhibits. Yeah, I know. But I, I think that I, I think it. that um, I want to show you the exhibits at a future time. Yeah. And then I think it's appropriate for us to kind of make our legal arguments at that time. But other than that, I don't have any other evidence to offer to the board. Okay. So. It yeah. makes sense. So I, yeah, I think it goes on Tracy to throw out some dates to come back. Okay. So let, before we on. before we do that and we get our calendars out, let's um, let's. So we're going to be coming back. We might have to date soon, but we're going to try to do this as soon as possible while it's fresh and, and all that sort of stuff. Things. So what we'll do when we come back, um, both parties will have that information that you're going to provide, and as well as the board. Uh, then you can finish your presentation based on that additional information, correct? The town assessor does have, will have right to, at that point, talk to those and, and after that digesting and see them. And then you both will have, a, after other questions are exhausted, 
there will be a time for a summation. After the summation, then we will go, uh, if, if time permits at that point, then we will go into open deliberation and for the case. If not, we may have to schedule another uh, a date to come back and, and go th and do our deliberation. Okay, I just wanted to kind of give you the, the process there. All right, having said that, Tracy, I know we have one unexpectedly open up on Thursday, hopefully. Uh, so my question is, can you, Dave, you're going to be here on Thursday anyway, right? So I know you'd probably be available. Yes. Right? I was going to be here anyway. You were going to be here anyway, too. So there's two for two. Um, Kelly, that would bring goes to you then. My scout troop will just have to meet without me that night. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope there's a, a, another, another uh, person figure, stepping in. He'll figure it out. Okay. And so the date would work for every, and that's 6 p.m., right? Mm -hmm. So that would work for everybody here. So that would be Tom, continuing this Tom, I don't know if you're, I can't, I'm not sure if, if you'd be needed, needed or not. Or that, that would be, be Jim's sure. call on the button. I, I think the, the real question is, we can the board meet, but also, will there be adequate time to review these? Well, that's your, well, well we're going to get those copies now, right? You said you had right. room for yeah. everybody? Right. And, of course, I brought copies. Thank you. Them. Well, Thank that you goes know. without saying. <laughs> right, so we would have copies as we walked out of here. The question is, is that going to be enough time for you? Is that going to be enough time for the board? Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. we'll be all right with it. Yeah. So we're going to shoot for the yeah. test. So, and we, we were going to be here on Thursday anyway, so that's why I'm saying this is kind of a rare, a rare occurrence that this only that could happen. So the only, there would be, there is, it's not 100%, we can schedule it. If there might be a possibility that it didn't happen, then we, because we, we have another case that <coughs> cleared our docket, I think. If that didn't clear our docket, then obviously we'd have to, that would be the one we'd be here to listen to. Uh, so, saying that it does, then why don't we schedule it for Thursday at 6 o'clock? Make your job easier, doesn't it? The continuation of this. The continuation yeah, the public of this hearing is, is open. That, that's the one that I think that cleared up and potentially they're working to settle it. No more trees. Um, is that acceptable for both parties? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's plan on Thursday at 6 o'clock. We'll continue this hearing with the additional information, and you need to pass those out, Kelly, before you leave here, all parties, please. Uh, Derwood, am I missing anything? Nope. Uh, any other? Uh, the only thing I'm, I might add is uh, we haven't done this in a while, but it might be an option if you felt the need to go into executive session to talk about legal um, advice not deciding the case, obviously, but uh, that is something that the board has from time to time done. Yep, we've done that before. Do you think we should do it now or maybe before? No, I mean, the maybe yep. at some point in the next meeting, yep. you know, at the end or at the beginning or in the middle. Right. Thursday? Yeah. Or at the beginning or the end? We don't even know if we're going to, so let, let's plan on the end. Yeah, she, yeah, she's being thorough and talking about noticing it. Yeah. You could note, put it in the notice and then not do it. Put it on the agenda for the end, and then um, if the board didn't want to do it, they could not do it, of course. Okay. <coughs> Any Excuse other me. questions, comments for the board? All right, hearing none, we'll uh, adjourn until Thursday at 6 o'clock. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.